Matt Schertz nets invasive black bullhead catfish fry in the clubhouse pond in late July when it is warm and shallow and the fry swim up against the bank. We're having some kind of fish kill event for the catfish. You'll see a lot of catfish carcasses around, but they still seem to produce. Prior to 2012, we were unaware of catfish invasion in the pond until we witnessed a great blue heron swallow a catfish whole. Look right here, here's one. One strategy to rid the pond of catfish is to make the water anoxic in the winter when the pond is iced over. But bullhead catfish are tolerant to acidic waters and high carbon dioxide with low oxygen levels. Because of the invasives, we have less garter snakes than I'd like, and I need to get DNA samples from garter snakes. I've got only four samples from this pond as of right now. It's pretty late in the season to only have four. Whereas in the northern floodplain, I probably have between 15 and 20 samples. Cleaning out invasives and, and looking to see if I get lucky enough to get a garter snake. What, what you try to do is net as many of the, the catfish tadpoles as possible, and you really only get one swipe out of it, because once you go through, then the school breaks up and it's also the water's muddier and they hide in the mud. And they have, of course, stingers both on their peck and dorsal fins. How bad does this sting? It, it feels like a little shock, it hurts. In my experience, it, it's sort of like being stung, but it's almost like, it feels almost like a little bit of an electrical current. The turtles have come in. Both adults and juveniles have really taken advantage of this area. This end of the pond is one of the nurseries. Got more baby turtles will make it and stay in this pond as a result of the expansion. And will the turtles eat the catfish? The turtles will eat just about anything. They're the cleanup crew. Okay, here's another. Ah, oh, look at those little buggers. It's like tiny little whales. Bob Schrader says sport fishermen released the bullhead catfish in the Bitterroot River in the late 1980s. They became prolific in the pond. A fish kill event in 2014 and 15 eliminated some adults. Last time I was out dip netting them, the net was up to here, solid catfish. On the other side of the pond, and it's just like, it's like 30 pounds in the, in the net, you know. You know the, the one thing that's been weird this year is the bullfrogs haven't been that bad. Like last night when I was walking to these sloughs, we didn't see a single bullfrog. We've taken on the bullfrogs and done quite a good job on that, I think. A higher percentage of the garter snakes can evade the bullfrogs. Bluegills are another invasive fish species on the northern floodplain. They root through the greenery and prey on native amphibians like spotted frog tadpoles and salamander larvae. Great blue herons also contribute to spotted frog mortality. This heron plucks an adult spotted frog from the riparian zone. The heron rinses the frog and consumes it on the bank. Right, I'll lift up this hoop and we'll see if there's anything in there. We'll just see if we've got anything. See anything? Oh, here's a, here's uh, one of the the great culprits here. So uh, bluegill. Oh no, that was bad. <laughs> okay, I just re-released it. Uh, <laughs> we trap bluegill to prevent them from preying on native amphibians breeding in the pond. Bluegills eat immature dragonflies that live underwater and feed on bullfrog tadpoles. The dragonfly larvae eat invasive bullfrog eggs on the floodplain, so it is in our best interest to control invasive bluegill. Mom. Only the real odd ducks, like <laughs> reptiles and amphibians. Thinking of it in terms of an ecosystem research, we got a video of Badger two winters ago. He dug up hibernunculus, so he carried over a big bull snake and carried over a racer, and it was just cool. See him like carrying him to his den after he dug him up. That's awesome. I like seeing that kind of thing. What I don't like seeing is the snake smashed on the road it by takes us. Much effort <laughs> yeah. To get rid of one. As catfish diminish, we hope to create insect diversity and detect more amphibians and native fish species, such as whitefish, squawfish, 
and sunfish. Bullhead catfish stir up the pond bottom and create a muddy and turbid environment that reduces light for aquatic plants. Bullhead catfish are tough survivors and can live on land for hours. The herpetology hotspots for the ranch along this edge and the sedge, a walk in the hope of getting a garter, and I saw a few little toads here last week. Here, you can see how small and camo they are. So he started out in a knot of probably 400, and there's only a few left. What you want is a larger breeding event, so you get a large congregation, and then several hundred will make it. But when you only have like two small breeding events, then there's only a few dozen will make it to the end of the first year. So this job is a lot more fun than being a professor, I'll readily admit. This job, I just get to be a kid. Flip a couple things in. Matt flips logs around the pond and looks for garter snakes. So I just try to do is spook one out of the grass if there's one in there. This oh, log contains there. one small deer mouse that scurries into the grass. That's what I see mostly, deer mice. <laughs> the terrestrial garter snake or the wandering garter snake we have here, there's, it's about a four to one wandering garter to common. And the common have the red dots on the side. It's a warning color to most species. Bullfrogs, I think, just see them easier. And they'll kind of just probably zoom right by a big bullfrog and then wham. And so it's really our young snakes that get taken out before they're sufficient size. Matt dives for a garter snake. This is fun. Uh oh, you're little Another too. Awesome. But see, this is one I can't sample. It's a juvenile. But this is a common garter. The tail tip collection project started last year. It is a micro satellite analysis of garter snake DNA. We are looking for subtle to large variations in genetics across the region. I'm taking tail tip samples for DNA a rice length of the tail tip, not of juveniles, but of adults, some sub-adults too. And then that's be sent to the University of Georgia lab over uh, the winter. I think I had 30 some samples last year and this year I've probably got over 50 already. Matt measures the length of the young snake. It measures just under 10 inches long. And one of my objectives was to clean out all the big bullfrogs before the babies are born, which is late July, early August typically. Two common garter snakes mate. Females give birth from 6 to 18 live young, but can have 70 to 80. Western toads are found in conifer, cottonwood, and willow habitats in western Montana. Where are we going? Um, down to the creek. I just want to see if there's a, a snake moving down the tunnel. Western toads lay long strings of eggs. In the Bitterroot Valley, a clutch of 20,000 eggs were laid in May, and tadpoles emerged by July. Tadpoles mature in shallow, still waters. The largest congregation of western toad tadpoles measured a meter wide and 300 meters long. We follow Matt through thick vegetation and look for western toads along the creek. Okay. In the cloud? Right above it. Doing presence and absence, and we're also pit tagging adults too in the evenings in the next week. But this one I'm just going to take a measurement on. Matt retrieves the toad to measure and record her location. Look at the orange and the heretic gland. That's what protects their uh, head and their eyes, especially. Something bites down on the head, they'll hit the heretic gland first, and of course get the, the toxin in their mouth and then spit the toad out. Coons will flip them over. A couple of weeks ago, I found 
just the top back of the toad so the raccoons peel the back off basically. This raccoon tracks a western toad. Once it finds the toad, the raccoon consumes part of the skin. Then it peels the skin off the toad's back to get rid of the poisonous bufotoxin. And then rinses it in the water. Matt measures the length of the female toad. As big as they come, 118. One of the interesting things about the population in Davis Creek is in most of the records, smaller toads live in upland environments, but we have these giant toads back here in Davis, which is really kind of cool, actually. They live good lives back here. She likes you. Oh, yeah. The best of pals. See how good they are at climbing? They're actually pretty amazing climbers. Just seen them hike right up a talus slope before, like it was nothing. Western toads were once abundant in western Montana. Since the 1990s, their population has declined. Population decrease is due to habitat loss, loss of water sources, fertilizers, pesticides, and livestock tramples. Juveniles exposed to more UVB rays may increase mortality. We travel further up Davis Creek to the Trout Pond. We find native trout in the pond. That's where the trout have been breeding for the past 10,000 years. Yeah, it's <laughs> genetically pure native trout. It doesn't connect to the river. We also find a western toad. But yeah, that's typically what they do when I'm filming them. They're hiding out at the bottom of the water, trying to look like a rock. Late at night, Matt surveys Davis Creek for snakes, toads, and frogs. I mean, they can be anywhere. The frogs, or the toads for that matter, or the snakes can be like right up under the bank, like in here. Or I'll be standing right by the bank and they'll be right there. It's kind of fascinating. I was here last week and late afternoon and there are 11 tailed frog tadpoles. Here's a snake, right there, right here, right here. See, this is a total hot spot. So cool. See, now it's substrate crawling. The wandering garter snake forages for tailed frog tadpoles in the swift stream. They crawl along the rock bottom in search of tailed frogs. Adult snakes are skillful at hunting in rapid streams, where juveniles forage in shallow, calm water. When I take a sample, I put the, the date. The species up here, wandering garter for WG. I took a sample earlier today at Kelly Island. And inside are silica beads to dry out the tail tip. I'm sterilizing the knife. Yes, I have not sampled this garter. Great. So I'll take a total body length measurement. So it's 17 inches. When they're in the cold water like that, they're extremely docile. Now it's temperature is picking up a little bit, so he'll start to wake up and start to move a little faster. It's pretty simple. Dip the tail on stick to powder. The important thing is not to lose the sample. Make sure the snake's okay. Stop the bleeding, and the snake is a little agitated, but it's still relatively docile. It's, it's amazingly calm for just having its tail tip amputated. So I'm going to let it go right here.
This specimen is a really, really dark checkering. It's black checkering. I normally don't see checkering this distinct and this dark. As opposed to a lot of the ones you see in the floodplain with a really yellow top line. This is a really tan colored. And it disappears as it edges to the tail, which is pretty common. So what you do is, to calm the snake, is you let the snake run through your fingers a bit. Matt searches for Rocky Mountain-tailed frogs. The frogs persist in fast-moving, small mountain streams a few feet wide. Adults forage at night. They eat invertebrates in and out of the water. A little more than two feet wide, but the opening there is some places 16 inches or less. There he is. We located a tailed frog in the creek. The Rocky Mountain tailed frog received its name because of its short tail the male uses to penetrate the female. The only frog in the world that has internal copulation. In swift streams, this method reduces the loss of sperm. Forest fires and timber harvests threaten tailed frog habitat. Tailed frogs travel along riparian corridors. Therefore, fragmented habitat restricts gene flow between communities. <laughs>